Okay, so everyone, we're delighted to welcome tonight um, author Angeline King Kelly, who will discuss, uh, among other things, her book, Irish Dancing, The Festival Story. And um, while she was researching this book and, of course, her experience in the north of Ireland, that it's more a shared experience between Catholics and Protestants in the north than maybe we realise. Uh, Angeline is from Larne and she has documented the history of a particularly famous Irish dancing festival. Uh, there's a long tradition of these Irish dancing uh, which happens up there. And so it is an important shared cultural experience between Catholics and Protestants, which of course is maybe more important now uh, than ever. The original Irish dance festival took place in 1928. And so um, Angeline's book highlights the ways in which Irish dancing has united communities even during uh, some of the most violent years of the Troubles. So um, I suppose that's what we're finding, Angeline. We're delighted to have you. Thank you for joining us. But, you know, it is in these kind of uh, soft diplomacy, we'll call them spaces or shared traditions that, um, you know, it's easier for people to maybe share and because they have something in common. And so they don't have to kind of discuss politics or religion or or the, the big topics. But I, I let you kind of talk to us about your findings first, and then we can have a questions and answers as always, type it into the Q&A feature and uh, I'll moderate. So I'll just, you know, mute myself and, uh, but we're we're listening to you. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you very much. So um, you said Angeline King Kelly, my name uh, is one of those things that causes a bit of confusion. So we'll start with <laughs> the name that I write under and my maiden name is Angeline King. So I just go by Angeline King usually, um, although my Gmail address does have a King Kelly in it. So that causes a bit of confusion. So the first book that I published was um, Snugwell Street, um, a novel. And um, then the prequel rather than sequel to it was A Belfast Tale. Um, the first novel was centered around a French exchange. So um, a young man from Brittany in France comes to Belfast. He comes to learn about Ireland, but he ends up in the Shankill area of Belfast. And there is a wee bit of dancing in it. Um, one of the characters goes off to France to um, learn about Fest Nos culture in Brittany. So there's a bit of a dancing theme there. I can't seem to escape it. Um, a Belfast heel. Um, it's centred around the Project Children programme, which you might know about because it's kind of relevant to your area. Um, it was set up by Dennis Mulcahy um, and it ran for um, throughout the Troubles and I think 30,000 children ended up coming to America. So this, um, the backdrop to this novel is that exchange. It's set in the 1990s. So there are some Troubles themes with both of them. But again, there's a wee bit of Irish dancing in this as well. So um, the reason why I probably have um, a little bit of an interest in Irish dancing is because when I was writing and I started writing at first after being in business for quite a while, um, I was doing an adult class uh, in Irish dancing. And then when my wee girl was old enough to start Irish dancing, then I was sort of um, more regularly immersed, I suppose, in uh, the Irish dancing world. And I was helping out at a festival one day and I was looking around me, standing beside a girl who was um, Catholic and I'm Protestant. And I was looking out at the crowd and thinking to myself, so isn't it funny that we all did this together when we were children? And um, we went to separate schools. So the Catholic children went to Catholic schools. And then of course, um, I went to just the, the local state primary school and we Irish danced in school. We Irish danced in the girls' brigade, which was pretty much nearly 100% Protestant. It was usually ran from uh, Presbyterian churches. Um, we Irish danced at the Irish dancing school on a Saturday as well. So here was this um, aspect of Irish culture that seemed to sit really easily um, in this context of Larne, which, uh, when I was a child was probably about 70% Protestant. Uh, so I would have gone to the town hall on a Wednesday night um, with my dad to practice for the Chia Memorial Flute Band. I played the triangle, wasn't very, <laughs> never managed to play the flute. Uh, so you had this same hall that was being used on a Wednesday night for the flute band. And then on a Saturday, we went back for Irish dancing. And again, it was mixed and I sort of wonder now if the dance teacher actually made more of an effort than 
I, I sort of appreciate it even when I was writing the book um, to bring people together. We always think of it as, you know, it was just like religion was never mentioned. If I, I interviewed lots of dance teachers and that's what they said, religion was never mentioned. It was just not a thing. But I am suspicious now about that. And I do think that these dance teachers did make more of an effort than what they might even admit themselves to bring people together. Um, so after that dancing festival, I got talking to people around me and there was a lady at the, the door who had been there for years and she was a dance teacher. And uh, I asked her a little bit, I realized she was born in 1930 and she'd been dancing since she was a child. So I thought, well, hang on. So you were dancing in the 1930s. So this festival is older than I thought. I think a lot of people maybe thought it had started, you know, after the war or something. Um, I did a wee search when I got um, home and looked up the old newspapers and discovered the festival had actually started in 1928. So then I had lots of other questions um, about this festival tradition of Irish dancing. So many of you will know the fish tradition of Irish dancing. Um, visibly, it's recognisable um, from the appearance of the dancers. Um, sadly, in my opinion, uh, they wear wigs and have you know lots of bright costumes and maybe even the girls will wear thick tan and they have those funny little socks <laughs> and um, not all of them will do that but that sort of style of dancing has become quite popular worldwide it's certainly if you google Irish dancing that's what you'll see and I sort of thought about that and I had become exposed to that through social media I suppose and then I thought well why are we not doing that you know why is this Irish dancing that we're part of why are we you know, the, the girls have their natural hair and they wear the sort of 1980s style. Well, they probably would actually have been 1950s style originally, the, the, the dress with, um, you know, the Celtic design and it's usually velvet with sometimes even with the traditional collars and cuffs. And so there was an appearance thing as well. And I thought, what's the story? Why is this different? And um, we just didn't know, like no, no one talked about the differences in the history of the festival and fish dancing we wouldn't even maybe have used that vocabulary it was just Irish dancing when we were children so I started to look into it then and what I discovered and many of you may already know how this all came about so the 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 first big dancing revival um happened during um the original Gaelic revival in the late 1800s early 1900s so that's when actually America would have first um imported um, Irish dancing. It didn't happen later, you know, some, some people think it happened around the time of river dance or something, but actually the, the Gaelic revival was already um, happening in America and you already had your Irish dancers um, starting up at that time. And here where I live in County Antrim, we had a big fish um, in the glens of Antrim in 1903 and Irish dance um, masters were brought from the west of Ireland to um, this part of East Antrim to teach the dancers the old style of Irish dancing. So up until that point in East Antrim there would have been a lot of Scottish influences among both the Protestant and Catholic population and so the dancers would maybe have you know had their arms like this and um, certainly they would have had their hands on their hips and so on uh, for the solo dances and this, this sort of Gaelic league idea was that the dancers should have their arms hanging loosely by their sides. Um, so there were some changes then at the time of that first big fesh in the Glen in 1903. So where did this festival tradition come from then? We know that the fesh tradition grew out of the Gaelic league. So where did the festival tradition come from? Well, during the 1920s, um, there was a big folk revival movement right across Europe. Probably even in America, I didn't really look into it too much in America, but I'm sure you can maybe tell me more about that. And um, people were worried uh, with, you know, cinema and so on coming to the fore that um, old ways were going out of fashion and particularly music and dancing. And so um, quite wealthy people in society got together and set up committees and organized um, festivals, which all came under the, the British Federation of Musical Festivals. 
And one of the most popular aspects of the musical festivals in the 1920s was Irish dancing. And one of the oldest festivals um, is the one in Larne where I live in East Antrim. And um, it's been running since 1928. And you could sort of say that it's almost the birthplace of the festival movement, although it was really a teacher from Belfast who'd been involved in the fish style of dancing who came to Larne and started teaching pupils. So um, the, the history of the dancing itself is too detailed really for this. So I thought I would pull out a few examples from the book um, to show you the type of thing that happened and explain how cross community um, this festival tradition of Irish dancing was. So this is the book, um, the festival, Irish dancing, the festival story. And you can see this little um, design around the cover of it. This is the certificate that was given out to the dancers for years up until maybe the 1960s. Um, that would have been what their certificate looked like. Um, they don't get certificates anymore, so I think that's why they, they don't use the certificate anymore. But I was able to get that scanned and use it for the cover then um, because it has some historic relevance. Um, this is quite a, a feminine story, um, quite a feminist story, you might even say as well. And um, there's a lot of women involved and a lot of very strong women whose stories just haven't been told. So the greatest joy that I got out of writing this book was actually telling these stories. And one of the most important characters, as it were, in this story turned out to be my old dance teacher, um, Marjorie Andrews. So I'm going to start with Marjorie and just read a wee bit of the book to give you an example of the things that Marjorie was up against. So I might have to put my glasses on now. Just it is quite big print, but just to make things a bit shorter. So Marjorie was 15 years old when she set up her um, dance school. So this was in the 1930s. And at that point, festivals um, welcomed the dancers who'd come from the Gaelic League fish tradition and vice versa. So they were all mixed together and they danced at each other's festivals and fish. So, a body had been set up called the Commission, so Anne Commission, um, I should mention that as well before I read this paragraph, to try and um, bring some regulations, I suppose, to the Irish dance and festivals. So under Anne Commission rules, the Irish language was a prerequisite to the fesh stage. And whilst the Irish language was not part of the musical festival syllabus, it had always been at the heart of the Fashana. Rule 22 of Anne Commission in 1931 stated, each entrance, each entrance, sorry, to a fesh dancing competition must undergo an oral Irish examination and each fesh committee must be satisfied that every entrance has a speaking knowledge of Irish. Okay, so you can imagine then that within um, Protestant households, there wasn't a lot of Irish really because the, the Protestant children didn't learn Irish at school. So this effectively meant that to enter a festival, you had to speak Irish. And um, my old teacher, Marjorie, was Protestant. I know that because she actually went to the same church as me. So I used to see her as a child in the church and she figured out a way of getting around this. Now, I didn't know any of this, obviously, when I knew her. She was just, she was a teacher. <laughs> you know, she wasn't... Um, a friend or you know telling me details about her life I had to search all this out so this was quite a an interesting journey for me to try and figure out how she had dealt with this um so let's see I'll, I'll move on a little bit of Miss Andrews large classes most of the pupils were Protestants who did not learn the Irish language at school Miss Andrews herself Anglican was pragmatic she simply invited an Irish language teacher into her home at St John's Place to provide lessons to a few of her Protestant pupils. Not only did she learn the Irish language, but she was one of the first dance instructors to achieve the TCRG exam. So that's the exam that um, the commission had um, provided. In later years, as a committee member of the Festival Dance Teachers Association, she frequently boasted of her TCRG achievement. One pupil of Marjorie's during this period, period was Noel Clark, 
a favourite of adjudicator George Leonard and a Protestant with no grasp of the Irish language. Miss Andrews knew that he was bright and that he was set to attend Lauren Grammar School. So she found a way around the language exam and entered him into an Irish history competition that served as an alternative prerequisite for entry into the fish. Noel was dispatched to a priest in Ballymena who taught him a whole new version of Irish history with a great emphasis on nationalist heroes like Daniel O'Connell. So Noel told me that story himself. Sadly, Noel died last year. Uh, he was born in 1930, and so he was dancing in the 1930s as well. And um, I just find it fascinating that um, Marjorie and her dancers went to these lengths. We hear a lot about Linda Irvine today and the, the massive impact she's had on Irish language learning in Protestant communities. And this kind of thing was happening years ago in Irish dancing circles. So rather than stand up and say, look, you know, we don't like these rules. These rules prohibit Protestants from joining in. They just got on with it and learned the Irish language, which I think is um, an interesting way of dealing with it. Um, I'm gonna mention a dancer called Lauren. Um, so this is us up to date a little bit. I'll take some water here. So Laura Milligan is um, one of the, you might say descendants of Marjorie. She's, she was taught by Lisa, who was taught by Marjorie. Um, she was a 21 year old agricultural student when I was writing this book. And Lauren is unique in that she can transform herself from graceful Irish dancer to lamb drum musician. A fact that may surprise those who are not familiar with the cross community nature of festival Irish dancing. So I don't know if anyone, <laughs> if you all, I'm sure you're all aware of what a lamb bag drum looks like and the sort of um, identity significance of that. But I always um, love seeing Lauren out with her lamb bag drum, knowing that she could just put down the drum at any time <laughs> and just start Irish dancing. Um, so there's little anecdotes like that in the book. So let's see if I can move on to something else. Oh yes, this is another little anecdote um, that actually the Irish Times, when they were running some um, promotion on this book, they find this story quite interesting. I, I didn't realise it was so, it, it would be seen as such a big deal, but um, you also had people who, you know, from the Protestant community who served in the British Army, particularly during the Second World War, and who went off to dance in Dublin as well. So let's see if I can, okay. So this story um, was about a dancer called Betty from Larn. Um, Betty dominated the Irish dancing stage at a time when dancers were permitted to move between the festivals and the Fashana. So we get to a certain point um, when that's not the case. Um, and unlike her Mulholl Mulholland school successors who were limited to the musical festival stage, she was able to enter fish competitions at a national level. In April 1943, when she was a serving member of the British Army, she won the senior title of the All-Ireland Championship in Dublin, despite not having danced for two and a half years. 600 dancers competed. So that was pretty much the equivalent of the World Championships um, in in that period of time that there was no worlds in the 1940s that came later. Um, the FESH organisations are, are now sort of splintered. The Commission is no longer completely in control of Irish dancing. There are lots of other governing bodies out there, but at that time the, the Commission made the rules. So let's see. It's quite weird not having a, people <laughs> on the screen. You, you're so I know, I'm terrible. <laughs> You know, we changed it because people were in and out and cats and dogs come in and out. So it just looks easier, you know, now when it's... Yes. <laughs> so you give me a wee wave, Elizabeth. I know, I, I'm not a wee wave. Are you there? <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to bring you up through the troubles here um, to describe what happened to these dancing schools from the festival tradition. The troubles from 1969 to 1998 should have deterred Irish folk dancers from taking to the road. In fact, I read, I'm just going to take some water, sorry. 
I read in a book by an American writer at one point on Irish dancing who pointed out that there wasn't much Irish dancing happening during the Troubles because of the situation. And I was surprised because I lived throughout the Troubles and danced. Um, I maybe should explain at this point that I, I was never a champion dancer or even a prize winner. They have these different categories in Irish dancing and um, there's prize winner, intermediate and non-prize winner. So I remained a non-prize winner all my life. To this day, I'm still a non-prize winner. <laughs> I was quite good though at couples and I think I just needed to hold someone's hand and then we did all the big team dances because our dance school was massive there were about 100 um, pupils in it so we would have entered all the um, local competitions and um, I've got some gold medals from the team dances as well so I'm a, I'm a team player um, I do like to have someone holding my hand so that's maybe why I'm out of my depths here tonight without <laughs> people waving at me. No so. no you're doing great. <laughs> So defying the troubles, this little um, section's called. The troubles from 1969 to 1998 should have deterred Irish folk dancers from taking to the road. Instead, festival Irish dancing flourished. Dance teachers braved bombs and bullets and defied the paramilitaries as they traveled across the province to enter dancing competitions. The religious ratio in Irish folk dancing classes, because Irish folk dancing, by the way, is what it was called at that time. It's sort of just become Irish dancing um, over just naturally it's shorter I suppose um continued to be around 50% Protestant and 50% Catholic with a higher proportion of Protestants in the festival Irish dancing classes in County Antrim towns and a higher proportion of Catholics in Belfast and Portadown. In 1975 the number of dancing entries at the Larne Festival was 1,500 a significant number for a town with a population of less than 20,000. I should say that the book uh, is actually about all the areas involved in Irish folk dancing. So um, Belfast, Portadown, Colerain, uh, Ballymena. I just so happened to have um, picked out a few Larn passages here. So that's a bit of a Larn bias today. One particularly challenging festival was that of May 1977, which coincided with a loyalist protest known as the United Unionist Action Council strike. A quick decision had to be made by the committee on the eve of the strike. Not only were there threats of roadblocks and transport disruptions, but it was feared that the electricity supply would be lost if Ballylumford Power Station closed down. In the end, commitment to Irish dancing prevailed and the committee voted 3-1 to keep the festival open. The 1,200 additional soldiers drafted in from England to address civil disturbances were small in number compared to the 2,142 dancers who took to the roads to travel to the McNeil Hall in Larne. So most of those dancers are coming from out of town. At, at its height, I think the festival was about 2,500 dancers coming from across Northern Ireland. Um, so I've got a wee insight here from a fashion designer who was called, who is called, sorry, Geraldine Collin. And um, Ger Geraldine had quite a successful career as a, a fashion designer and she was also an Irish dancer and what she said to me was Irish dancing especially festival Irish dancing transcended, transcended all religious faiths it was all about the performance so that was a little insight from Geraldine. I interviewed over 70 people for this book and um, so I had lots and lots of stories most of them women of course and uh, let's see, let's see, I had a plan. <laughs> it's gone smoothly so far, finding all the bits I need to find. So um, I just thought I'd mention about the dancing being exported since we're in America this evening. Um, you obviously have your fesh tradition that's been running in America for well over 100 years. But some of the festival dancers ended up in North America as well. Most of them ended up in Canada. Um, there was a big move of population in the 1970s um, during the Troubles from towns like Ballymena um, to Canada. And all these people, what I find really fascinating was they found each other. And uh, this was um, a lady called Sally Houston. And um, I'll just read a little bit about Sally Houston. When Sally moved to Canada in 1978, she was determined to keep the link with Irish dancing. So she opened up a dancing class in the garage of her home. 
Among her first pupils were Shirley McConnell's children, the great nieces of Agnes McConnell. Now, the significance there is that Agnes McConnell had been one of the first people to be involved in Irish folk dancing and ballerina and had set up a class in the Protestant Hall. And Agnes taught a dancer called Sadie, and Sadie taught Sally. And when Sally went to Canada, one of her first pupils um, were her Turk for first two pupils were great nieces of Agnes McConnell. So I thought that was a lovely story that, you know, they all find each other um, through Irish dancing. So Sally's Irish dancing style gradually changed when she moved to Canada. Anne Commission was the only governing body. In particular, she noted the straight legs of the fesh style as opposed to the bend of the knee that is still seen on the festival stage. Sally has since embraced the modern fesh style, preferring the wigs over disorderly hair. We had a bit of a debate about the wigs and she, she thinks that you know, they're better than what went before, which was messy hair. Um, so Sally Houston, the Protestant girl who learned to dance in Ballymena, is now vice president of CLRG, that's Anne Commission, in Western Canada. And she travels back and forth from Calgary to Dublin, where there is often surprise at the mention of the significant and widespread Protestant connection with Irish dancing in Ulster. Sally, like so many Irish dancers of the festival tradition, had the Orange Order as the backdrop to her childhood. And when she danced as an adult in Ballymena, there were five Irish dancing schools in the town, four of them run by Protestant women. So I don't know if you know the significance of places and how well you all know Northern Ireland, but you know, generally when I tell people this story about Larn and Ballymena, especially if I'm on the west side of the band, people just don't believe me. They don't. <laughs> I had to almost write the book at one point because no one would believe me. <laughs> so there's a wee story about the Irish Rovers there as well. I'll not go through that. Um, one of their dancers uh, still lives in Lauren actually. And uh, they were famous on TV in Canada and everything. So they were part of that movement as well. Um, okay, so I'll move on one more story just to think, and that's me with regard to this bit. Um, so we're up back in the 1970s, actually, again, and um, this story really struck me and a lot of people who read the book were quite moved by this story. Um, so I'm going to take some more water. It's quite strange doing things at this time of night, by the way. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking really softly. Can you hear me? Because I'm, I know, I'm, no, we can. Uh, and I appreciate you staying up. I know it is terrible that the time difference has, has been a pain. It's, okay. <laughs> it's grand. We're still on. I don't really sleep very well anyway. So this is a a way. Yeah, to it's sleep. amazing how many writers are night owls. It's funny. <laughs> I suppose yeah, that's your only time to get anything done if you have a family. Mm. I'd happily stay up until midnight just to avoid lying in bed, not sleeping. So this is fine. And um, so this. The little title is Common Spirit of Oneness and Unity. And that's taken from a letter. In 1975, and with two children under the age of five, Billy Mitchell was imprisoned for loyalist paramilitary activities. He served his sentence and became a peacemaker dedicated to cross-community work until he died in 2006. His daughter Julianne took up Irish dancing in 1977 at the age of six and kept dancing and competing until she was 18, a timeline that coincided with her father's prison sentence. Julianne attended the June Bet School in various locations, including the Treetops Hall in the Sunnylands Estate in Carrick, Burgess. So, the June Bet School, by the way, um, I, I interviewed June Betts for this. Um, and she told me that the prisoners in the maze used to make Irish dancing trophies um, that were then given out at festivals as well. So you could well have had a child who had an IRA connection in their family who was coming home with a trophy from a festival that was made by a loyalist prisoner in the maze. So it's just <laughs> it's little stories like that that just really struck me, you know. So... Um, by setting up Irish dancing, dancing classes, I'm just going to skip a bit and move ahead. By setting up Irish dancing classes in areas affected by political conflict, June Betts made a difference to little girls like Julianne, just as she had made a difference to fathers like Billy Mitchell. And I should say as well that June did set up dance classes in the housing estates. These were working class housing estates. She particularly seemed to almost um, target. Uh, and that's what I'm saying about these these amazing teachers, they, 
they said that religion didn't matter and they, they weren't trying to do this you know big cross community thing and build peace but they did and I, I you know I think that somewhere subconsciously there must have been a choice um to to bring people together um even if they didn't really recognize it themselves at the time so um this is a letter from Billy Mitchell um to his daughter um when she was seven years old so Julianne didn't get these letters I don't think until she was an adult and in fact I think maybe her dad had died by the time she got to see them so this is from William Mitchell in the Mays prison um, Sunday the 12th of March 1978. So those of you who know a bit about history might know a bit more about what was going on in 1978. I don't have any specific details to, at hand at the minute. So he writes to Julianne, there is a great heritage and tradition in Irish dancing, as there is in the folk songs and dances of any country, because it is part of the culture and life of ordinary people. It is a culture that comes from the heart and soul of the people and helps to weld us all together um, as a common spirit of unity and oneness. Not only so, but in a world of hatred and violence, it always brings a welcome interlude of peace and contentment. Believe me, Julianne, it will be a real worthwhile effort if you can manage to carry on. Music and dancing are forms of entertainment which soothe, soothe the savage beast and bring peace and tranquility in the midst of life's toils. When you come to see me during Easter break, I trust you will bring your medal with you and tell me all about the festival. So that's um, <laughs> the bits that I had thought might be interesting for you to hear. Um, he talks about the heritage of dancing. I, in the beginning of the book, I do go a bit more into why Protestants probably were so receptive to dancing is simply that they had been doing it all along. So I go through the 1800s and any documents and information we have available from that time um, to show how in many of the Scots communities in particular, people were just mad about dancing. It was often described as the only amusement, um, along with whiskey, in many of the <laughs> Scots communities. So um, and obviously fiddle music and all that kind of thing as well. And actually Irish dancing itself, the fesh tradition um, is made up of Scottish influences, Irish influences, English influences, and, you know, continental influences. You know, the dance masters came from Paris with, with new steps and ideas and um, everyone received the same dancing tuition. So at one point there was, a vibrant tradition of using the arms <laughs> and um, I do go through at the festival in 1928 I think it was 1929 1930 the the adjudicator keeps telling the Lauren dancers and Ballymena dancers to keep their hands by their side because they have a tendency to put the hands on the hips and so on um, but a lot of that's come back into style again you see the performance dancers from the likes of river dance and so on will put their hands on their hips and they do the more traditional style just in competitions we still have the the straight hands when it comes to the solo dances when when you the couples dances and so on would be more traditional they would use their hands and so on so have I taken up enough time or do you want me to talk more? <laughs> no, I think that's brilliant. Um, you know, I I think I will ask you, if you don't mind, to clarify one or two things. Like the first, and maybe it's obvious to people, but is the festival system then slightly outside of, we'll call it the fish system? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, lately what's happened is a lot of the festival schools though now um, send their kids to open fish as okay. well as festivals. So the two things are actually coming back together again. But what happened was the commission had all these rules in place in the 1940s. So um, children who entered the, the fish maybe weren't allowed to play hockey or mm -hmm. do ballet or um, attend any festival at which a Union Jack flag was displayed. Mm -hmm. So it sort of came to a point where um, the festival dancers couldn't go to the fish anymore mm -hmm. um, because they didn't meet the requirements to get into the fish mm -hmm. but the festivals kept running um they didn't have a governing body so they okay. were just all these women came together and ran these festivals and just invited each other so there was one in Portadown the Portadown 
um, you know, contact there would have contacted all, and I suppose in those days, writing letters to all the other dance schools associated with the musical festival world. And mm -hmm. I mean, I've helped organize um, one festival and it, it really is quite complicated. And mm -hmm. so what these people do who run these festivals, you know, it really is quite amazing. Um, as I say, at one point you had these quite wealthy people who'd formed committees and so on to set this thing up, but gradually over time it became just that, you know, the dance teachers themselves were running these things. Mm -hmm. um, in the early 1970s, the commission itself split in two, and there were two governing bodies at that point then within the FESH world. And um, at that point, the festival dance teachers were encouraged to get together and form a body so they formed what is now the festival dance teachers association so there mm -hmm. is a governing body for festival still very very small um world of dancing compared to fish i mean there's no global presence really um which you know would be nice to see if, mm -hmm. if it could spread because i mm -hmm. think people would really welcome you know that especially the the dress and and the traditional dances mm -hmm. um, the fish dances now are that wee bit more athletic and modern and mm -hmm. you've got that kind of pageant look that yeah. has maybe been influenced by America. I'm not sure exactly. I've tried to pin that down when I was writing the book. Where did this come from? Yeah. Um, couldn't really come up with any um, concrete answers on that one. Um, I think Michael Flatley maybe has a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> like here, you know, when we were learning in Kerry, like in the 80s, there was no wigs or fake tan or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, when I say that the festival's separate, as a, you've got these more modern fish now that are just open to everyone. And okay. so you've got a lot of the festival schools um, really enjoy just going to a lot, as many festivals as possible. So they'll take their kids to fish. And some of them actually do wear the wigs. Some of them okay. turn up in their festival dresses, but most of the festival schools wouldn't do that. Most of them just stick to um, their the own sort of cycle. Circuit. Yeah. yeah and so that's obviously then very northern I had forgotten of course sure you know with the tightening kind of of um rules you know like the GAA were the same too if you you couldn't play GAA if you were playing soccer and stuff so that relaxed eventually I could you know probably in the 90s and the 2000s yeah, I would but imagine that's all gone long ago please, thank god yeah by the time it had gone I would say that um everything had changed anyway because the fish um had split into um and it's, Congo, I think it's pronounced, and Coco, yeah. right, you say it in Irish, um, mm -hmm. have limited Irish, <laughs> a bit like my old dance teacher I did actually go to an Irish class eventually, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that was great, and so yeah, you were mentioning um, the Irvine connection, uh, uh, you know, or to do with the, the language, like Angeline, can you explain to us how, or I mean, this is going to sound very gauche, I'm trying to put it nicely, you know, how do particularly people from a unionist background, not necessarily yourself, but like people who are literally in the Orange Order or playing, you know, a land backdrop. What about the Irish dancing or that kind of, you know, what I suppose we think of as Irish Catholic, you know, Catholic is implied sort of thing. What draws them to it and, and how are they able to hold those two identities in their head at the same time? Yeah, I, think, I think that's why you have to go back into the 1800s to see yeah. the evolution of dance. And to see that these dances, the Gaelic League maybe um, looked at dancing broadly. They went into the countryside. I know Potter O'Rafferty in the book, I, I talk about him because he came to learn and, and taught some of the initial classes in Irish dancing. He went out into the countryside and collected dances from lots of locations. I mm. think he was maybe a traveling salesman from um, a few bits and pieces that I've gathered on him. And so he was probably able to pick up a lot of information on his travels. And mm. some of those um, dances would have been coming from, you know, he wasn't specifically going to Catholic families and asking mm -hmm. them to show him. Dances, dances were picked up, you know, anywhere. And mm -hmm. people did go to dances together um, to the same place. You know, there wasn't that division necessarily that we kind of see through modern eyes, particularly mm -hmm. in towns like, you know, the, the provincial towns um, weren't maybe as affected by the troubles as Belfast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in Belfast, you had almost ethnic cleansing in places where people did li live completely separate lives. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, there probably are less Protestant dancers in Belfast than anywhere, mm -hmm. any of these other places. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the Orange Order and so on, a lot of the tunes that I, I know from my dad being in, in a flute band, 
a lot of the tunes are Irish tunes anyway. So mm -hmm. music's a bit like dance where you don't divide things into Ulster Scots, Irish, and what you, you play, what you play, and you yeah. know, you play what music you enjoy and what sounds good. And so there would maybe have been like a hooli after the Orange Order um, mm -hmm. parade on the 12th, and they would have played Irish tunes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there had been little girls there who were able to dance, they would have got up in the Orange Hall and danced. So it's mm -hmm. a sort of like separate area. So there's never been that conflict with okay. orange men. And a lot of the dance classes were run in orange halls. Mm -hmm. So um, actually Lawrence Festival was run in a leisure center, or what is now the leisure center. There used to be like a hall down there at the harbor where the festival was run. But for the last, I don't know, maybe um, 15 years anyway, um, the festival here has been run in the orange hall too. Mm. So it's funny you have um you know sometimes people arriving into town and the band's men will appear because there's always a band around you know the May Day Festival and uh, you know a band will come in to collect their drums and stuff <laughs> banners whatever <laughs> and they'll arrive in in their uniforms and I remember um being at a festival and one of the the dance mums from um outside Lauren was just so amazed by this that she ran and got her camera and got photographs and put them on Facebook of her daughter with these bandsmen on the <laughs> steps so you know oh for God, her it was yeah. a surprise because she came from Ooh. a place where that wasn't happening and she came from a Catholic background so she was surprised to see this yeah you know, this this thing happening but from I know my dad was an orange man and from his perspective, I, I don't think he ever even mentioned Irish. I just went, everyone went, you know, mm -hmm. from a young age, my mom, we, we had um, neighbors who were Catholic when I was a child, our next door neighbors. And I remember mom made the Irish dancing dress for the wee girl next door mm -hmm. um, when I was about three or something, you know, so, mm -hmm. and that's another thing, the dressmakers again, yeah. you know, my aunt Jean, um, who died last year, she was 108. Mm -hmm. Um, Whoa. <clears throat> I interviewed her for a separate thing and didn't get this to add it into the book but she had been making Irish dancing dresses for years she was making them in the 1930s mm -hmm. and I didn't know you know and mm -hmm. um, because you used to have to make the really intricate collars and cuffs they don't really mm -hmm. do that so much now and so you have Whoa. all these women around Lauren you know so there's a whole like uh, lots of different industry kind of yeah, yeah. Um, like a little cottage industry. And as you said, a lot of women, of course, being the influence, which is interesting because I think in the old days, you know, it was kind of a dance master. Um, but now yep, these women are, are the teachers. Yeah. Yeah. I go through that in the book about how that sort of shifted from dance master to dance mistress through mm. some of these urban centers mm. that, you know, came about through dance halls and that kind of thing in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And then dancing I think throughout the 20th century I, I don't mention this in the book or anything but it kind of did become a bit of a woman's domain you know that you still mm -hmm. had all the little, little boys dancing up until a certain point but certainly by the 1980s when I was there there were only a few boys mm -hmm. and um, that what put them off was the kilts <laughs> yeah <laughs> god well I mean there's a big tradition of kilts in, in even the orange order or the bands and you know the marching bands and stuff so they'll they'll have to get used to that but then I suppose Celtic Thunder and Michael Flatley and all that maybe sort of helped men to rejoin uh, the dancing yeah and he wore trousers of course. and he wore trousers yeah yeah <laughs> I, I love a man in the kilt I can't you know I wouldn't complain <laughs> I know it's funny because it was almost like it was okay to wear a kilt to be out with a pipe band but not okay to wear a kilt if you're dancing it's yeah, yeah. thing as well I don't think it was just the kilts I think there was a certain thing um with boys and dancing just generally by the 1980s yeah yeah it didn't fit in with their idea of masculinity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's so interesting. Um, you were when you were talking, you reminded me too, like the Belfast Harp Festival in 1792. You know, like there's been this huge tradition of saving culture, Irish culture, you know, traditional culture in the north that maybe kind of gets sidelined, you know, as we particularly in, in a free state Ireland will say, and after prohibition and things, or after um partition, God, prohibition, another thing, after partition in the 20s, you know, to think that. I suppose, particularly under De Valera's Ireland, like he really laid claim to what Irish culture was and, and that, yes. you know, it kind of imbued it with this Catholicism. Whereas actually, you know, a lot of the tunes that we have today were saved because of the Belfast Festival in 1792, you know, so. Yeah, through bunting and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So there is obviously a, a way for like Ulster, whether they're Protestant or not, to see themselves as part of an older Irish tradition that kind of predates the Republic of Ireland and, and yeah. the split, you know, yeah. There's a big massive wave at the moment. Uh, you, I don't know if you've had um, Linda Irvine or any people from tourists um, on speaking. We haven't had yet, but I'd love to get her. So maybe yeah. it's, it's, it's really interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Linda came to Lorne. I, I tried to set up an Irish, well, I did I successfully set up an Irish class in Lorne, a public Irish class. I think it's probably the first public Irish class that's, you know, been hosted in Lorne for a very long time. Yeah. And I set that up a few years ago and the, the demand was quite high. I had 50 people come along to the first um, class. Wow. The, the numbers dwindled as as it became apparent how difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually yeah. I left myself after five oh, years. No. I got oh. to a point where I went to a poetry reading one time and I sat and listened and thought, oh, this is lovely. But the only word I recognise is August. After oh. five years of <laughs> yeah. The end. Oh, good. So, but oh, there's a massive well, And Ulster in the dialect is very difficult, even for me, you know, like yeah, coming yeah. from Monster tradition, they, I think they, the Ulster dialect That's is difficult, right. you know. yeah. It is, yeah. And there's a bit of Scottish influence probably there as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there, there's a big reclaiming of... Um, that 1798 thing, you know, there's yeah. actually a, a group called Reclaim the Enlightenment mm. who are quite active in Belfast and they've invited me to come along to their burn supper and oh, they, they're very much inspired by 1798. And then I don't know if you know, Claire Mitchell has just written a book about, mm. it's called The Ghost Slim and um, Protestants in the Spirit of 1798. So that's all yeah. sort of she, she's been interviewing people who she would consider to be alternative Protestants. Okay. And um she she actually has a chapter on the book on me, um, oh. on with particular reference to to the Ulster Scots stuff that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Um but as I said to her at her book launch, I think I am the most sort of the, the least alternative Protestant in your book because the rest <laughs> of them are so <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't really leave behind I suppose a lot of the things that I grew up with okay, I kind of yeah. let them well because you were already alternative you know <laughs> maybe maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. But they all for me it's always coexisted yeah and so, um yeah if I hear a band period like um, I live in the town center if I hear the bands I'll run to the end of the street just because I'm yeah. used to doing that I'm the only person in my house who does that <laughs> yeah yeah and um oh. yeah so I think I I just everything coexists for me I love mm -hmm. I love all the different strands of our culture and just, yeah. you know. Well, you know, it would certainly be a more hopeful place, I suppose, up there. You know, we we had, funnily enough, um, a showing of that movie, the Project Children movie, just, I think, in, was it before Christmas? Oh, yeah. yeah. So okay. I was interested to hear you bring that up. That was, you know, what a fantastic yeah. idea to bring kids from both traditions over to, our, to America, you know, and, and get them out. Yeah, that movie had a really profound effect on me, actually, because I had worked in, um, I'd met Dennis Mulcahy, the, the yeah. guy who was the main uh, part of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. the, the, the person who created the whole thing, didn't he? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I um, went and worked in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1999 for um, Carol Wheeler. I don't know if you came across her. She was in that documentary yes, yes. Carol had set up the Washington DC chapter of Project Children and yeah. um, I was a student an intern and um, the other interns all ran off to Clinton's office and yeah. senators <laughs> offices and whatever and I worked for Carol um, taking oh. care of the the parents who were bringing these kids over from Derry and Belfast that yeah. was a big eye opener for me I had oh I'd say so yeah you know, I, mm -hmm. I just didn't know those children and, and the circum their circumstances it was mm -hmm. really um it had a very profound effect but I, I then of course wrote the novel about Belfast Heal which is about um a project children dad mm. who brings um a kid over from the Shankle Road of Bel in Belfast and then he comes back it's a bit of a love story yeah um, and when I wrote that book, I didn't realise that one, that the, the, a Belfast tale centres around a real event. It's all fictional, but and the characters are all fictional, but there is the real event of mm -hmm. the Shankle bomb um, happens in the middle of the novel. And oh. when I wrote that book, I did not know that one of the bombers had been on the Project Children programme. I didn't oh, yeah. find it out until I watched that film. Saw the film, I swear, yeah. I just, I just clicked pause and I just... I could not believe it. I could not. Yeah. I just was so surprised. Yeah. Um, 
uh, anyway, it, it I suppose it made the book even more valid or something as, mm-hmm. in, in a sense. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, if anybody looked at the book in years to come, they'd say, oh, she must have known that. She didn't. I know, <laughs> and didn't, yeah. yeah. So. And Angeline, do you, I mean, I, you can not answer or, you know, how hopeful are you for the North of Ireland now? We ha- What were we talking about last night? Um, oh, God. <laughs> oh, I know. It, it was a, it, it actually it was talking about how the American civil rights movement influenced and had connections with the Irish, you know, civil rights movement up in the North. Because uh, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day. So we were just talking about, you know, a post-Brexit Northern Ireland and the fact that Stormont isn't up and running still kind of thing. You know, we, how hopeful are you for the state? You know, just the Northern Irish, we don't have to talk about reunification or anything, but, you know, how a post-Good Friday agreement, you know, are we still, is it still peaceful? Do you think peace will last? Yeah, well, I um, always remember what my friend Norman told me. You, you may have come across Norman Houston. He was um, he worked in the Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington yeah. for years, mm-hmm. and he passed away a couple of years ago. And I got to know him when I was on that program back in nineteen ninety nine. Wow! And um, he always said that the peace process is a process. It's yeah. just something that we we go through every single day. It's not like, you know, it doesn't end. The process never ends. We're going to be mm-hmm. in the process for a really long time. So I always just think of it like that and, and kind of um, accept. It's very frustrating at the moment. The, the whole um, Brexit, Brexit thing has been a big shock to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, I was brought up um, as a Protestant to... Um, embrace the European Union I learned yeah. languages I studied languages at university we were told that we were training to work in the EU and I did mm-hmm. I went and worked in Holland for three years I worked in France for a year these were things that you know were drummed into us mm-hmm. and it's been a big shock mm-hmm. you know psychologically not having yeah. that there anymore right so, and know also of course voted to stay in you know the in, effectively in, yeah 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 effectively so there's a lot of people who are a bit lost right yeah. now because of that yeah. and I think it's changed politics a little bit mm-hmm. I think a lot more Protestants are having conversations like the, the what if conversations so skipping mm-hmm. ahead to what you were saying you know um yeah it would be it would be great to, to deal with this whole situation now um mm-hmm. but there are conversations going on um mm-hmm quietly just in people's homes you know if I'm with friends you know we're just everyone's chatting about that what would it look mm-hmm. like what would happen mm-hmm. and um that's I think quite new absolutely uh, yeah it's something yeah. that's come up since Brexit mm-hmm. and the disillusionment particularly over the last couple of years mm-hmm. has, you know hit hard oh um, very much so even your health system is you know <clears> like it, when there's no function in government it's a pity like for ye, you, you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone's suffering yeah um, Although having said that, I think there's still a large enough part of the population who are um, determined to hold on to the union that I, I don't think that it's going to happen. Um, Overnight. As like, soon yeah. as some people might predict, you know, people out there have been predicting it'll be 15 years. It'll be the, you know, I just mm-hmm. think that there's a generation there that will hold on. Mm-hmm. Um, regarding the, the next generation, um, I'll give you an example from my own family. So I'm a mixed family. Um, so my children have Catholic Protestant heritage mm-hmm. and um I've never sorry I'm just good. I'm glad you explained that I knew what a mixed marriage was but I'm thinking Americans <laughs> mightn't but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um when I was a child mm. I knew I was a Protestant from the day I was born I swear mm-hmm. I, I just knew I, I I heard the word every two minutes I, yeah. I reckon when I was in the cot I heard conversations <laughs> <laughs> it was on tv all the time there were you yeah. know violence on tv constantly and we always had to watch the news and i was very very much aware of what was happening i remember actually in washington dc people saying to us that the thing they that struck them most about the children who came over in project children was how much they knew about politics Mm -hmm. my children know nothing about politics they watch youtube videos american videos they know nothing about what's going on and you couldn't even teach them because they've no interest and my little girl, I remember her going around to the YMCA a couple of years. It was before um, before the whole pandemic thing. She went around to the YMCA and they were doing this peace thing. It was like peace for money or something that was being used to run these courses. And these people had come down from Belfast to talk about Catholics and Protestants and so on. And she was just 
completely confused and she came home and said what's a protestant you know she just hadn't, <laughs> hadn't realized and yeah. you know, she didn't and she was probably yeah. about you know 10 years old or maybe wow. nine at that point and she yeah. just hadn't heard those words mm-hmm. so there's a generation coming through who are either going to be very naive <laughs> mm. or very or very, very open <laughs> kind of yeah going to yeah. offer us something really special yeah. um, because they just don't have those silos the limits I suppose and yeah and, and the categories you know I, I actually that was one of the questions I wrote down to ask you that you know when the festivals were set up for us you were saying that you know you kind of just went to a hall and but I was wondering like I mean you know we had always been told that people would know by your name sort of thing or, or what school you went to if you were Catholic or Protestant or, you know, and I read those books, what was it, Love Across the Barricades? I remember the Kevin and Sadie books. Oh, yeah, I loved them too, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, you there are in the... fascinating that you read them in County Kerry too. Yeah, yeah, they were very much part of the, like, I must have been early days secondary school, but, you know, I suppose we too had friends in the north of Ireland, you know, so my parents have a furniture store and a lot of the furniture was made in the north so you know a lot of the companies were protestant but then we had one very close family and it's a mixed marriage as well you know the the wife was a free presbyterian and and the father was catholic and you know we were always very conscious of that like (laughs) it really is you know yeah and just outside the border in monaghan you know (laughs) so yeah it it is an unusual yeah combination but these i suppose you know small towns you know your choices are limited <laughs> yeah, yeah you know but um so when do you think the kids you were saying like that maybe the teachers didn't necessarily intend to um kind of break barriers or or you know amalgamate everybody but do you think the kids knew like oh look Angeline is obviously you know Protestant or you know Cahill is Catholic like did people know that when you were or it just wasn't school? relevant yeah you- in Northern Ireland, you automatically clock what religion someone is. You just work it out. And it's yeah. really sad that you do that. Like, it's, I don't yeah. know if that'll, <laughs> for my generation, I don't know if it'll ever disappear. I and know. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't go anywhere. It, has ne- it doesn't necessarily have any relevance. But yeah, I would have known the girl who sat beside me, Roisin. I would have known that right. Roisin was, you know, Catholic because yeah. of her name. Yeah, and yeah. She went to my school. So she mm. was quite unusual because she went to a state school. Um, but I knew because mm-hmm. she didn't say the last line of the Lord's Prayer. So oh, there's all these clues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's we stopped talking before. For a few, you. I always remember saying, it was a girl across the way, she was called Emma and she was a hard one to figure out, you know, yeah. so I was like conscious of looking over going, wonder. And again, she was at my school. So I, I, I didn't find out for years that she was actually Catholic as well. Yeah. Um, because when you go to the grammar school, there's quite a large proportion of um, Catholic kids who would go to the grammar school. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah it, you can usually work out what primary school someone had gone to yeah was, but, but it wasn't like you would use that information in any way it was just you know a, a sort of like clocking a registering of yeah that fact you know and it's like that scene in Derry Girls you know what have they in common and <laughs> you're like oh Catholics are mad about their statues you know <laughs> I know I know I wouldn't even have known half that stuff when I was yeah, yeah anyway. <laughs> Well, you know, we had Emma de Sousa on last year. Um, she was running for uh, um, running in the election at the time, you know, and she she had done some work kind of because her husband is American and he was denied a visa. It was all this complicated stuff after, you know, the, the Good Friday Agreement. But she um, is part of this cross body group, I suppose, where they are trying to talk about, you know, what will happen and, and how will it happen? And she said a very interesting thing to me because, you know, I had attended a talk online, I think the Trinity university down in Dublin ran and they were talking about you know we'd have to get rid of the flag and we'd have to get rid of the the national anthem in the Republic of Ireland and I you know was almost kind of taken aback because you know I had never thought that we'd have to compromise like we were going to just subsume you know and she she yeah, said it beautifully like it, you know, like it really was frequently. yeah, yeah. That's up. all the conversations I've ever heard the first thing that comes up is always the flag yeah and, you know, when I heard it first, I was kind of sad because I thought, but that flag was designed deliberately, like to have peace between the green and the orange, you know. But then Emma said, and so like my back was a little bit up, you know, and Emma said, but, you know, has the state over 100 years, has everything that has been done in the name of that flag, you know, been something that you would approve of? And I was like, oh, you know, aside ever from Northern Ireland, when you think about the Magdalen homes and, you know, like there's reasons for me as an Irish woman 
to say, yeah, I would be open to moving the flag. That has nothing to do really like with reunification even. So she just said, you know, the more people we have at the table, the more ideas we have and, and you know, that there'll be compromise possible. And I thought that was a really beautiful, it might take women, you know, to do this. Yeah, and <laughs> yes. another thing is that a lot of people nowadays don't associate with orange and it doesn't yeah. represent them as a color. Um, there's a very small number of people who are actually in the orange order. Yeah. And also it's kind of like a male representation. It's this idea that, you know, you're basing something on brethren. Yeah. And that doesn't sort of include, I know there are women and, the, you know, the women's orange order and stuff, but um, yeah, the, the colour orange is something in itself that needs to be challenged, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, to so there's a lot of room. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping that both sides or all three sides, you know, can be... Um, open you know and and calm but um this is one of the ways to do that i think you know is through these shared traditions and and the culture which is so important to both sides that really transcends kind of you know a religion which is kind of a private thing anyway you would think you know like that's what you do yeah. on sunday is your own business like you know yeah, yeah. and then another thing of course is the number of people going to church is <clears throat> really really declined as well um i was speaking to yeah. a presbyterian minister and he assured me that the Presbyterian church is still quite healthy numbers but mm. um, I and I, well I haven't seen the statistics lately but we can look across to England and see what happened there over the last 20 years and see that yeah um you know religion is going to become less and less relevant maybe absolutely and even down in the republic you know I don't know if you saw some of the locally run like primary schools you know about 13 or 14 of them in rural areas like have been now taken out of the control of the church you know and, and yeah. they're going to be ecumenical um Lynn says she's been married for 50 years and had an ecumenical marriage service I was Protestant my husband was Catholic but the priest Father Sullivan did say to us before the wedding that these marriages mixed marriages do work out she always laughed at that <laughs> So well, I, we didn't realize actually we were doing the family tree about maybe 15 years ago maybe more than that and um we discovered that my great granny so my mum's granny was catholic and married a protestant so well, I, I think yeah. that that this kind of thing happens um quite a bit in the late yeah. 1800s um because of the proximity that people were in and mm -hmm. so on and then maybe just a lot of how we feel about things have become sort of tarnished by our recent history and yeah we forget that these things did happen before yeah absolutely um, yeah yeah because quite a lot of people have discovered they had a catholic granny or granda or mm -hmm. great granny or granda they didn't know about once they started looking at the census yeah you know, well and even things like the great hunger you know there was a lot of kind of false oh should the great hunger never touched ulster but of course it did you know poor people everywhere oh, yeah, were they, dependent they, on they the potato were in Larn, the, the, workhouse yeah. was, the numbers doubled or something you know it was yeah um, yeah crazy um, Abby asks, how do we get to a point where people don't remember or believe the rich history of Protestant participation in Irish dancing? So, you, yeah, I think you had just started to say that, that there, you know, for maybe two or three hundred years, particularly during the, you know, Gaelic revival, the Celtic revival and all that. Um, and then maybe just, as you say, in our recent history with the Troubles, it may have become just too divided, too too binary. Yeah, so the the point of the book really was to express that Protestants have always Irish danced and still do mm -hmm. and it, the surprise seems to come according to the area you live in so I yeah. remember going to Armagh and people being surprised in Armagh when I was talking to them about this because in Armagh that there maybe isn't such a rich tradition of Protestant teachers running Irish dance schools in Orange Halls mm -hmm. and uh, so there's certain areas where it grew up and it was kind of organic I could actually nearly work out how it grew up I remember reading about a dance teacher in Portadown who had come from Larne and she'd mm -hmm. moved to Portadown as an adult and then she set up a class there and that's how Portadown ended up with you know the dancing so there, it's it, it sort of just grew organically from these teachers moving to different areas and then of course trying to grow their dance school so a teacher in Ballymena who wanted to grow their dance school would have maybe set up in Ballymoney so that, that's mm -hmm. another very unionist town and uh, so that, that's how the thing grew but um, I think that one of the experiences I had from the teachers and the people involved in dancing was they did not like me talking about religion in reference mm. to Irish dancing because they just kept saying religion just has never been mentioned please stop mentioning that it's never been talked about before 
that's how cross community it was it was just so wow. um people don't like talking about religion yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I brought up a subject that was sore but I had to because I had to let the world know that this was happening Mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. what well, those people weren't here and what I was here and when I went to different places even Belfast I remember being in Belfast and someone from West Belfast would not believe me when I told them that I had Irish danced he said no yeah. but it must have been Scottish dancing <laughs> this is way before the Ulster Scots revival and I said no it wasn't he said let me see you had to do a demonstration to him to prove to wow. him that a Protestant yeah. from could Irish dance and he yeah. still didn't believe me it was very suspicious. He said those steps are just not quite right. <laughs> You're like, well, I never won a medal on my own, so <laughs> I should have said that at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but I was excellent in the teams. <laughs> well, well, you, uh, which is even better. Right? Like, Come here, do a couple, and we'll show you. Yeah, like. Exactly. I'm really around. <laughs> So listen, um, if nobody else has any questions, I think this was absolutely fabulous. Uh, I meant to tell the audience too, um, you're an accomplished writer and um, sorry, I just wanted to read out your, um, because you had a residency with the, um, where am I gone? I'm doing, um, I'm writer in residence of Ulster University at the minute. Mm -hmm. So I used to have a, um, a, a career in business and then I left to do the novel writing and ended up sticking around in this novel writing business mm-hmm. and um the Irish dancing book was a wee bit of a tangent I went I was actually supposed to be writing a novel at the time and I sort of found all that stuff and went off on one um in that direction but then I came back to my novel writing and ended up um applying for a PhD at Ulster University in creative mm-hmm. writing and that came oh. with a writer in residency oh. um, for three years so I'm in the God, third year great. And funny, I'm actually writing, um, I'm doing some research on the Gaelic Bards of Larns. This is another one that's um, surprised people. So there were three main centres of Gaelic poetry in um, Ireland, and one of them was Larn. And I just love this. I love telling people this. I'm like, wow. we have a poetic land here, didn't you know? Because people yeah. think of Larn in a different way. And um, yeah. the, um, of hereditary bards called Ogneef, and they were Olav, which meant they were... Um, master poets uh, in mm. the 1500s and 1600s wow. and I think any anyone who studied Irish will probably at university level will probably have studied Farflet of Neath. Um, mm-hmm. he wrote about the downfall of Gaelic Ireland and so I have written wow. a novel for the PhD about a young Presbyterian woman who becomes very much um, inspired by the fact that her land is poetic and that oh. these bards lived potentially in at the end of her garden and everything so we've had yeah. some fun with that I've, I've been spent a lot of time in the 1500s and 1600s researching that oh. so oh god that's great I'll that's come great. back and give you that talk sometime yeah I'd love it <laughs> well and you were a you know a member of the Irish Writers Centre you received an Arts Council Individual Award and um, you're a member or promote writing through Women Allowed in Northern Ireland too. And you're a blog writer, so very busy mom, you know, as well. Um, and yeah, yeah but it's died since I took on the PhD. I just thought, oh, yeah, <laughs> you can't do it all. <laughs> no, the PhD is more important. But that's fascinating. I, think I used to have loads to say. And uh, yeah. got to a certain point. I thought I don't really have anything to say today. You oh. must like must like write a blog today, but I can't think of the subject. <laughs> I, it's difficult, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Betty, one of our other members who has ties uh, to the north, said that her great grandparents in Northern Ireland were also a mixed marriage. The great grandfather was Catholic, and the great grandmother Presbyterian. And some of her younger generation are now in mixed marriages. The farmers in Derry, both Protestant and Catholic, help each other out. So it is, you know, I suppose the community kind of trumps everything, really, you know, and unfortunately, we only get to hear sometimes the the bad stories or the extreme stories. But, you know, it seems like. um, And quite often you get to hear just the urban stories. Right. Not not the provincial kind of, you know, small times. Yeah. Um, Where life goes on with neighbours, you know, and, and, and as you say, a long tradition. It's great to think those bards, you know, uh, because, of course, they would have been writing about the same topics that they were down in the south you know the bad landlords or you know terrible weather or, or local this heroes. This is the fascinating thing they yeah. um, became known as Agnews so that mm. their Irish name was Agnew um, and their um, anglicised name was Agnew. The Agnew mm. family eventually became the biggest landholders in the area. Wow. So this family actually turns out to be Scottish so they're mm-hmm. the most, but they're actually from Scotland originally. Mm-hmm. But they have, you see, at that time, a lot of the, you know, 
people from um, the Western Isles and so on, to them, their Irish heritage was very important. So even though they were Scottish, they mm -hmm. had long-term roots in Ireland. Mm -hmm. and, you know, their name was obviously Irish and so on as well. So wow. yeah, they it, it's a really interesting story that kind of demonstrates how our language, the whole language politics at the minute um, mm -hmm. is, is one that comes up again. It's actually stalled Stormont in itself, itself mm -hmm. at one point. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to demonstrate through this a new family who, whose correspondence was in the Scots language. So if you go back to their letters, I've seen their letters from the 1600s written in very, very broad Scots. Mm -hmm. But yet they had this branch of the family who were Irish bards. So you've mm -hmm. got all the language coming together through this one family as well. Mm -hmm. Some of them were Catholic because they had come here before the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And then some were Protestant because they came from Scotland after the Reformation. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of a lesson in how we're actually all the same. Right, exactly. And the identity is almost kind of, um, what's the word, false, <laughs> you know, sort of a, yeah, the, the, I yeah, the more narrow very identity. Strong, um, we're all doing our DNA tests at the minute and I have a strong, oh, God. very strong um, <clears throat> Scottish heritage and mm -hmm. his um, DNA test results are 80% Irish. Oh, so, classic. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably, again, it's that movement of people yeah. back and forth from Scotland. Yeah. So they probably went there as Gaelic speaking Irish people. Irish people, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, became immersed in Scots eventually, came mm -hmm. back. They came back, you know, yeah. Their descendants yeah. came back here in the 1600s. And so, you know, it's. Yeah, think you think you're like, Scottish, but you were actually Irish. Yeah. Well, and yeah. that's just like the trade between the two places was huge. And, you know, the Bruce yeah. family were involved. And then when you think about, you know, Irish nationalists well proto-nationalists but you know like Red Hugh O'Donnell and all of these guys and then later on even as you said you know the, the United Irishmen most of them were Protestants so we have to kind of we should all allow that to be reclaimed you know or or to yeah. find its place you know that's um, what yeah. a lot of people are doing at the minute yeah like, good. there's even just being on Twitter of all places you can really mm -hmm. see there's this kind of search for something for yeah. an alternative history yeah, good. People are just ready to embrace their Irish roots and find yeah. out more about that because it's been denied them as well, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And that it doesn't have to be black or white, you know. This yeah. was the this was the mistake like that was made in the twenties and thirties and then again kind of in the seventies and eighties. You know, it was so yeah. extremist. Yeah. Yeah. Mistakes were made with the Irish language, definitely. Mm -hmm. And on both on all sides, or they're not mm -hmm. two sides, there's always like lots of sides. Mm -hmm. um, and now there's this kind of interest in reclaiming that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we just have to, you know, hopefully everyone will have the space so you sort of to do that, you know, because there is room. And I think a good thing for Ireland and the Republic too, you know, we've had so much incoming immigration in the last 20 or 30 years that even our own, you know, what it means to be Irish today does not mean oh, white and Catholic and, yes, you know, yeah. Um, that's actually quite significant um, for another yeah. sort of thing that's come up in my life in the last couple of years. We have this system of testing children age 11 and splitting them up into grammar schools and secondary schools. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the things I, I most hate about Northern Ireland. Um, so I was always one like a less academic track kind yes. of. Yeah, mm -hmm. it means that sometimes kids can get lost. I failed it myself, but then ended up going to a grammar school a year later and did very well in the grammar school, which kind of proved the system was wrong. Yeah. on an individual basis and it's it's been wrong ever since then mm -hmm. um, so you, you can't judge children at age 11 it's, it's yeah. completely unrealistic and there are things like the day and the test and how they feel and all the rest of it mm -hmm. but um you know one of the things I started to think about was integrated education we were sending children on buses to seek integrated education integrated schools mm -hmm. um and there's lots of people from Lauren who'll bus their children to Ballymena and Carrick Fergus and so on mm -hmm. but I looked at the local high school um, which is traditionally perceived to be a Protestant school, actually is an all-ability school that welcomes anyone. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed actually just walking to school was the diversity. It's mm. not, you know, judging a school nowadays on religion mm -hmm. is kind of missing the bigger picture. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Yeah, because you could have refugees. Muslim refugees who are going there as well. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that will be helpful to both sides because it's that's true too. I forgot even Northern Ireland, you know, has had immigration and refugees and everything. Yeah. So... You know, definitely the landscape is changing, which is, you yes. know, only for the good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, look, thank you so much, Angeline. We kept you up late. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I We have nothing the rest of this week. And then on Monday next is our Brendan Fahey Bequet, um movie series, documentary series. We're showing a documentary called The Camino. Uh, it's about four Irish musicians and artists who row a little Corrock boat across to Spain and then go on that Camino. So it's kind of a, a journey of spirituality. And then on the 26th, we have New York Times journalist Malachi Brown, was going to discuss um, his work in Ukraine uh, about the war, the Russian war in Ukraine. Thanks, Jean. She says, thank you for a fascinating and charming discussion. And um, <laughs> then on the 30th, we have Dr. Margaret Lynch Brennan, who's giving a talk about the Irish Bridget, the Irish maid in America. So we're looking forward to those. And thank you very much, Angeline. We're going to get your book in the store in our gift shop. But of course, it's available online if anybody can't wait. <laughs> the three of them, the three books. And best of luck with your dissertation. And we'll definitely have you back. Thank you so much. It's been thank a pleasure. Thank you, Nato. I enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you. Someone else is saying thanks. Yeah, Betty, thank you. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.